Good afternoon and welcome everyone. We have a terrific uh, group today. Uh, we have 200 people on the call, many local and national longtime supporters and friends of the Fred Hodge. And for some of you, it may be the first time you're connecting with us. We have found these forums, uh, particularly do, during the pandemic, to be wonderful opportunities to share some of the incredible science that's happening at the Fred Hutch and how we're responding uh, to the COVID uh, crisis at this point. Um, and I really do look forward to spending the next hour together and sharing some of the very best that's happening here. I'd like to start by sharing Fred Hutch's Land, Labor and Justice, Justice Acknowledgement, which recognizes the ingrained injustice that has shaped and can use to shape our culture and institutions. We acknowledge that we work and live in the traditional lands of the Duwamish, Dulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. We thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We support the ongoing struggle for justice against racist, religious, sexist, xenophobic, ableist, trans antagonistic, and all oppressive violence. We recognize with gratitude those who sacrifice, struggle, and labor to make our freedoms possible and challenge us to learn, work, and live justly. And we read, the land and justice acknowledgement uh, before all group meetings or large group meetings at the Fred Hutch. And it's I think one of the reasons the pandemic has spotlighted uh, to all of us how uh, communities of color are disproportionately affected uh, by disease. Um, and, and this is not just COVID, it's also cancer. We know, and, and Nancy Davidson will be joining us today from a breast cancer standpoint, we know that black women have almost a 40% higher risk of dying from breast cancer than white women. We know that in prostate cancer, it's similar for black men with, uh, with uh, far worse uh, statistics in terms of uh, prostate cancer survival. And here in Washington state, American Indians and Alaskan natives have the highest incidence of lung and colorectal cancer and are most likely to die uh, from uh, these diseases. And I think our understanding of COVID-19 in conjunction with where we are um, in the Black Lives Matter movement and the social justice moment um, it's pushed us harder to, to, to recognize these differences, not just in COVID, but also in cancer. We're very grateful that our supporters, partners, and patients who benefit from our research understand how important this is uh, to achieve our mission. So today's conversation is going to really be terrific and one that I think you're going to enjoy and going to really enjoy asking questions. Our topic today is navigating cancer and advancing cancer research during COVID. What impact has COVID had on cancer? That's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, I think the one thing we have learned very clearly is how important science is, how important generating ideas are at the Fred Hutch. True whether you're talking about COVID and the work of our VID staff, or whether you're talking about cancer and everything that happens in our clinical research division, population sciences, human biology, and basic sciences. Ideas become cures and cures start here. Really important part of what happens at the Fred Hutch. As many of you know, Fred Hutch researchers stepped forward as soon as COVID-19 arrived in the US and have been major, major contributors in the effort to stop the uh, pandemic. Trevor Bedford and his team uh, at the Seattle Flu Study, and as you know, the Seattle Flu Study is a great example of collaboration within uh, Seattle between the Brotman Beatty Institute, University of Washington, Seattle Children's, and the Fred Hutch all working together. Um, and we know that the Seattle flu study has transitioned uh, to the COVID study and it's allowed Trevor and other molecular genomic epidemiologists to be able to characterize and understand uh, the nature of our epidemic. Also, earlier this month, month we launched the COVID-19 Clinical Research Center which is one of the first facilities in the nation designed specifically to test novel interventions to treat and prevent COVID-19. And I think a really good example of, of why that resonated so much with me when Larry uh, uh, Corey first talked about it, is I think about the work of Nancy Davidson, who we're gonna hear about soon. Nancy's work that demonstrated, you know, being HER2 breast cancer and advanced disease can have some benefit, significant benefit for women, but when you treat people with breast cancer with HER2 treatment early, you increase the cure rate. And the same concept might apply in viral diseases. We know, for example, that with Tamiflu, if you use Tamiflu early in the course of influenza, you get your greatest benefit. 
Maybe that's true with remdesivir as well. Maybe that's true with the monoclonal antibodies as well. And yet you can't study early disease in a hospital. It requires a special outpatient clinical research center to be able to do that. And we're going to talk to the people who are leading that effort and talk about how important that's become uh, here at, uh, at the Hutch. So as you know, ending cancer is our core mission. And that's why people come to the Hutch um, as scientists, and it's why we come to work uh, every day. Uh, fearless science that doesn't hesitate to ask important questions, doesn't hesitate to push us forward um, in this mission. Um, and I think while COVID has changed the way we work, it hasn't changed what our focus is as we move forward. And I think one of the things that makes me most happy was the opening of the steam plant, an example of that work. Um, and it just opened, and I think we have a steam plant video uh, to share with you today. You know, when you look at that video and you see that building, you think about the people who actually built that building uh, more than 100 years ago. What it was designed for was to produce steam that would drive the industrial engine of Seattle. And now uh, it's, it's become a very different facility, incredibly collaborative, a kind of place where team science is going to be able to, to really thrive. And what we've chosen is to have some of our most important science there, science that focuses on the immune system, science that focuses on the creation of cellular therapies um, are in the, in the steam plant. And we're delighted uh, that the facility is now up and running. So today we're going to have three of my colleagues who are going to join us and talk about today's subject. We're going to look at the effect that COVID-19 has had on cancer patients. We're going to look at how we've adapted care at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and here at the Fred Hutch. And we're going to talk about the impact of research, clinical trials, and our mission to develop new treatments. So I'd like to begin our discussion by introducing Dr. Nancy Davidson. Nancy holds leadership positions at the Fred Hutch, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and the University of Washington. Uh, as everyone knows, she's the president and executive director of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and she runs our clinical research division here at um, the Fred Hutch. Nancy is also extremely well known as a world-renowned uh, breast cancer researcher um, and, and has accomplished remarkable things in her career, being one of only uh, two women to have been the president of the American Association of Cancer Research and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And uh, Nancy, I think we want to uh, talk a little bit today about what's happening at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance in terms of clinical care and how uh, COVID has impacted this. And I want to just start off by commenting how remarkable it seems that your team has done in terms of patient safety. So before we talk about the actual disease, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to make the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance safe during this time and make our patients feel um, comfortable with care at that point. Tom, from the very beginning, we knew that cancer wasn't going to stop. And so we had to continue our cancer care and our cancer research in a time of COVID. So we've taken all the steps that all of us are taking, physical distancing, hand washing, masks, all the things that we should do in our everyday life, we absolutely do in the context of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, we worked very hard at the very beginning to think about when patients need to come in and to minimize the time that they have to come in. We worked pretty hard to think about how we can use telehealth where appropriate to make sure that individuals can get some of their care at home so they don't even have to come in to see us. So, And then, of course, we've all had the access to rapid testing which we do as a matter of routine if somebody has to have a procedure, for example. And of course, we're very careful to test people if they have even the least hint of symptoms so that we can make sure that we're able to optimize their health, protect them and their family, and protect our staff. 
And, and, and I think the question I would say is, how do you think COVID-19 has impacted the lives of cancer patients? We already know that cancer itself is an extraordinary event in the life of any person. How is it, what has it been like for, for patients during this time? I, I, it's hard to imagine a worse combination than getting a cancer diagnosis, taking cancer therapy, and then doing this in a time of COVID. But people are so resilient, Tom, and I've been so impressed by how many patients have just rolled with it. Um, in a weird way, sometimes for patients, you know, you don't have much of a social life. You don't go out very much anyway right now. Um, and so it's an easier time uh, if you're really involved with your, your cancer care. Um, to have to stay at home and to do your regular activities in a home setting. But I, I wouldn't underestimate how difficult it's been. I do think, though, that cancer patients and cancer providers are always very focused on safety measures anyway. And what's good for us is that everybody's focusing on it now. And so we're all helping to keep our cancer patients safer. Yeah, and and, and Nancy, you know, our colleague, uh, Ned Sharpless, who, who runs the National Cancer Institute, Ned authored an article which talked about how some of the impact of COVID on outcome from cancer patients is that we may see more cancer death as a result of missed screenings. Now, you're an expert in breast cancer and, and have commented frequently on how early detections made a difference in the outcomes that we see from breast cancer. Are you worried about women missing mammograms? And remind everyone this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How does that factor into your thinking about, about where we stand in early detection? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that Dr. Sharpless pointed out to us that modeling in our experience so, so far suggests that up to 10,000 more people will die from breast and colon cancer over the next decade because of our lapse in screening or less screening during this COVID time. You know, we, we took a little break from screening right at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic because we didn't know everything that we know now. And also we wanted to be in a position where we could uh, retain our protective equipment. Um, which was in short supply at that point. But you know, screening is open. We encourage people to come in for their regular screening, very, very safe in our facilities. Um, and so I think people shouldn't miss a beat about making sure that they do all of the age appropriate screening for cancer that they would be eligible for. We are and, open for business. Perfect. And, and Nancy, I know that when you, you come to the campus of the Hutch and not see that remarkable construction uh, a project which is ongoing right next to the SCCA building. Can you tell us a little about that? Because I know you're incredibly proud of that. Yeah, actually, we're, too, we're proud of two things that happened despite the pandemic, um, Tom. First is within the existing building of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, we completed um, a renovation of our seventh floor into a new care model where basically patients go to their patient care room and everything comes to them. The blood drawer comes to you, the scheduler comes to you, your infusion comes to you, your doctor comes to you, your nurse comes to you all in one space so that you don't have to walk around our building. Everybody comes to you. Now, we organize that, Tom, because, of course, we thought at the time that would be more patient centric. But it turns out we were maybe a little visionary and it turns out to be very good uh, model of care at a time of a pandemic because it allows patients to be in a little bit more of a protective bubble while they're in our facility. So that went live in June. Um, this is where our gastroenterology medical oncologists have centralized their practice right now as we try out this new model. And you're right, we had a virtual groundbreaking in the summertime for the expansion for the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. It's going to be right next door to our uh, existing building. I look at it a couple times a week. I go up and look at how they're moving the earth around. And we're incredibly excited that this new expansion will be online in the early part of 2023. For those who come into the campus for any reason, I hope you'll look at our construction site. And for those who are staying away, I hope you'll be with us in a year or two when we have more to show. Yeah, and Nancy, it's, it really is remarkable what they've done just in a few months. Um, they're making great progress there, so it's really terrific. So thank you so much. Look forward to hearing from you in a little bit. Um, next, I'd like to introduce John Lee. John's a clinician researcher who studies prostate and bladder cancers. He's an assistant professor in the Human Biology Division at the Fred Hutch. Um, and he sees his patients at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, we know that uh, the, the diseases that John, te uh, John treats are, are tough uh, diseases. They, they require uh, a great understanding of the biology of both the prostate and, and bladder tumors themselves. Um, and John is using um, pioneering big data approaches to find surface proteins on the surface of prostate and bladder cancer cells that could be targeted with immunotherapy. And part of the Hutch 
efforts. One of the things we're really working on is trying to make trying to make uh, immune therapies work better in patients who have solid cancers. You know, immune therapies have been remarkably effective for patients who have by, patients who have leukemia, lymphoma, um, and some great successes in in in, in melanoma, renal cell, and some lung cancer, and some in bladder cancer. So I guess I'd start off with with John. Um, you know, bladder and prostate are very different diseases, okay? Uh, when you think about them and their ability to be treated with immune therapies, what excites you and, and makes you think that, that there's opportunities there for, for novel approaches? Yeah, I think that there's a lot to be excited about in the treatment of prostate and bladder cancer. I'll tell you a little anecdote that when I was a medical student, a senior physician once told me that specializing in this area as a physician scientist would be career suicide. Um, so I can tell you now that things have changed quite a bit in the last 15 to 20 years. And, you know, that's related to efforts really led by investigators here at the Hutch um, that have advanced and established new standards of care uh, for treatment of patients with advanced prostate and bladder cancer. Um, I'll give you two examples. For instance, uh, my colleague Petros Grievous uh, recently led a study looking at maintenance immunotherapy in patients who responded to first line treatment uh, for advanced bladder cancer. Um, this has recently become standard of care and is really a good option that extends life, quality of life in patients who have otherwise sort of waited around until their scans show progression of their action go on. Um, I'll give you a second example, which is uh, the work of Pete Nelson and others in the Prostate Cancer Research Program, um, who've been involved in multi-institutional efforts to characterize uh, alterations in DNA. Uh, that define different subsets of advanced prostate cancer, and a really important work uh, driven by this group identified DNA repair defects in prostate cancer that contribute to the recent approval of new drugs for men with uh, prostate cancer that have these abnormalities. Um, I'm also excited about um, many areas of science that are advancing uh, for both of these diseases related to next generation imaging, and certainly, as you mentioned, the development of uh, new immunotherapies, uh, which my lab focuses on, to really unleash the cancer-fighting potential of the human system. And, and John, has COVID impacted your lab? Uh, give me a little sense of how your lab is functioning uh, during COVID and, and what you think, you know, have you missed a beat or not? Where do things stand with your lab effort as, as impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, so I started my lab here at the Hutch in uh, early 2018. It just really started to hit our stride when labs ramped down due to uh, the COVID pandemic in March of this year. And as you can imagine, as an early career investigator, this was especially daunting. Um, I will have to say that, you know, that the leadership at the Hutch was extremely supportive and really focused on putting the safety of the staff first. Um, and then the subsequent safety precautions and phased approach to really getting us back into the labs was very thoughtful and really very well executed. Um, in all, I'd say the ramp down delayed many of our projects by somewhere between three to six months. Uh, but I can say that we're now back to pre-pandemic levels of productivity. And the touch and funding organizations have been especially mindful of this impact um, and the impact it's had on cancer research overall. And they've really provided a lot of uh, leeway for investigators. Like, um, you know, the future is still uncertain. There's a lot of anxiety associated with a potential third wave. COVID, um, and many charitable foundations um, are not as financially sound as they were uh, prior to all of this happening. So, you know, we do fear that uh, there may be long-term effects on cancer research funding. Yeah, and, and I guess one other question for you in prostate cancer. We talked in the very beginning of this uh, presentation about the difference in outcome between African-American men and and Caucasian uh, men in, um, in prostate cancer. Um, where do we stand in understanding that disparity in prostate, scan prostate cancer screening and treatment? And, and has COVID impact any of that or any of the things that make you worried that there could be a disproportionate impact in cancer outcomes in that setting? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know I want to acknowledge that, as, as you have, that Black Americans are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And, uh, you know, many have held a well-rounded skepticism and a negative attitude about the medical establishment. Um, and I think this is you know, certainly uh, well-grounded because of sort of historic, well-documented missteps um, in the past. Um, you know, this is uh, in the setting of recent work that really indicates that men who have access to, you know, say, of our standard of care prostate cancer treatment will actually do 
as well, if not better than their white counterparts. So and I do have a fear that this pandemic will uh, reduce the desire of black Americans uh, with prostate cancer to seek care, um, and that they may be at the greatest risk of uh, delayed cancer diagnoses as well as uh, treatment in this environment. So, so John, thank you very much. We're gonna bring you back in just a few minutes. Um, to answer some more questions, really appreciate it. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Christy Stifler. Christy is an Associate Vice President for Clinical Research Support at the Fred Hutch. She also coordinates clinical trials at the SCCA. She's someone who is, as you could imagine, indispensable across, uh, across our institutions. She also provides operational support for the Hutch's COVID-19 Clinical Research Center, which we talked about earlier. And She's also very important in making sure that our clinical trials meet the requirements of the National Cancer Institute and all the other regulatory agencies that look at us. So, Christy, welcome. It's really fantastic uh, to have you with us um, today. So, the first question I'm going to ask you um, is, how has COVID-19 impacted our ability to, to, to do clinical trials at the Hutch and the SCCA? Um, what did we do? I know you and Fred had an incredibly important role in making decisions about what trials we could safely do. Tell us a little bit about what happened in the in the spring and where we are today. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, it's it's been an interesting journey to to say the least. Just to give folks an understanding of some of the volumes of, that we're talking about when we're looking at our oncology clinical trials, just um, in of themselves, we. In a year, we have about 500 active treatment trials that are open to accrual, and we accrue about 1,200 patients on those trials. And so as the, the pandemic became clear, the situation we were dealing with, we had to make really quick, tough decisions about how we would manage our clinical trials and, and our patients that were either on clinical trials or they're, a lot of times their only treatment options are to enroll in a clinical trial and thinking about the, the risk versus benefits in a very different environment. And so what we, we first um, really looked at the, the phase of trials. And so early phase trials by design are really looking at um, safety and they're looking at dosing, for example, not even looking at efficacy. And, and some of our later phase trials are the randomized trials where we're providing an investigational product and some patients are randomized to receive standard of care. So in those cases, we said, if there's not a, a, a demonstrable clinical benefit um, to patients, then those are not the trials that we should be enrolling to right now. If there's, a, if there's a treatment option that we can provide patients, that's what we should be doing. So that was really sort of the, the, the big picture approach when we first started looking at, at assessing trials and enrollments. And then we really had to take a look at some of the individual trials to say whether some of the, the interventions were likely to lead to inpatient um, visits for, for patients that otherwise may not go inpatient or ICU um, visits because we were working with our, our hospital partners who had a very stressed system from the PPE um, supplies to just staffing levels in the hospital. And so we couldn't continue to stress those if we had alternative for, alternatives to offer patients in that case. And then we also had to think about a lot of our patients are immunocompromised. A lot of them travel all over the country and, and from other parts of the world. And to consider that on a case-by-case -case basis of whether the increased risk of bringing someone here to enroll in one of these trials was worth the potential clinical benefit of some of these interventional treatments. So that's really where we where we started our, our assessment. And we had a, an amazing team of our faculty leaders and representatives from SCCA and from our hospital who were an infectious disease uh, faculty who were providing us daily input on where we stood with our census in the hospital, what infection rates were looking like, and what our capacity was to really um, bring additional participants that potentially need additional care when they're going on these trials. And what, what was, what really was the responsible decision to make um, across trials and within individual patient scenarios? And, and patients obviously come to the Fred Hodge for clinical trials. So if a patient came now, would they have the full range of clinical trials available to them? Yeah, so we did. We ramped down to about 50% of, of our clinical trial accruals um, and, and trials that were 
um, enrolling participants. And I'm happy to say that we are back to pre-COVID numbers, both in accruals and number of trials available to participants. Um, we actually started ramping back up in early May, which I think is just a testament to the, the passion and the dedication of, of all parts of our, our environment and our institutions in, in keeping people safe and also prioritizing um, providing treatments and, and doing our research. So yeah, we are, we're back to full capacity. And Christy, one of the things I, I'm most excited about is the new COVID Clinical Research Center. I had a chance to tour the facility. Um, it's really a beautiful building in that it's a great example of how you can repurpose something uh, to make it work. So what we did, uh, that was a facility that was being used for clinical research space and also some development office space for the obliteride uh, bike ride. Um, and it was repurposed and several different clinical areas were built out. Um, as well as areas to be able to protect staff and visitors, uh, patients who are coming and participants in, in trials. Um, the great thing is you can drive right in. There's a parking lot right there at the facility and all staying in within the same facility, walk right in without having to go outside. So it's got very nice access for patients. I think one of the other key things is we really couldn't have um, COVID patients going to the SCCA to participate in clinical trials there uh, because of the concern of putting other patients at the SCCA at risk. So it became a, a wonderful opportunity to do that. So tell us a little bit about the, the workup of clinical trials, because we know, you know, whether you're a fan of President Trump or not a fan of President Trump, I don't think we should get into politics on a, on a call today, but I do want to say that many of us are hopeful that one of the reasons he may have done well with COVID was the combination of remdesivir, monoclonal antibodies, and steroids. And, um, and the fact that he got those drugs, um, and he got them fairly early in his course, certainly could be consistent with them having more effect when given early. Obviously, it doesn't prove anything. It's a case report. And so we need more data. And that's why this facility is so critical, is to find that out. So what drugs are we testing so far? And how is the, it, the facility has only been open for a couple of days. How has it been going and how are the trials uh, going so far? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really exciting to be involved with that and to also watch how a lot of our expertise that's allowed us to be um, successful in oncology and in our vaccine development and infectious disease work have been able to come together to really make this facility happen to, to treat um, COVID infection early on in the infection, like you said, to, to bring people in before they're outpatient and to try to get ahead of the infection. Um, and so we do have um, trials activated and enrolling. Um, one of the trials that we have um, open to enrollment is the Regeneron trial, which is one of the, um, the drugs, the monoclonal antibody cocktail that, that the president received. And so we are enrolling on that trial. Um, he also received remdesivir, which has been primarily researched in the inpatient setting and is now moving into the outpatient trials, which which we'll be enrolling for within the next week, we expect. Um, there currently isn't a trial that is combining those therapies. So, so I think it's important to note that he received those products um, as part of what's known as a compassionate use uh, application with the FDA, which is something that has existed and, and we actually rely on for some of our patients at, at times. Um, but currently the trials are investigating those agents independently. And there's a lot of <clears throat> there's a lot of paperwork on most compassionate use uses, isn't there? Uh, there is. You know, the the way the FDA is set up, that mechanism is really try to reduce um, the the paperwork and the turnaround time. From it, it starts with first a physician who is willing and believes that there is an investigational product that is the best chance or or um, prospect for a patient to receive, and they need evidence of that. And then the next step is to go to the actual sponsor or the manufacturer of that product to say, okay, I have this patient and I think that they would benefit from this product. product. May we have a, some supply of the product to give this patient off-label? And then the next step is to go to the FDA. And in reality, we can get that turned around within days, actually, because a lot of times, you know, this is these are treating patients who are really ill and have no other treatment options. Uh, so there is a sh really short turnaround time for that process, but again, it's it's a case by case basis, um, and it requires people dedicated to getting that that yeah. patient 
that that treatment. And I know it's something really important that we do offer to patients in many circumstances. I'm just going to guess that my suspicion is that the president didn't have a lot of trouble with the paperwork or getting the necessary approvals. But we'll 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 let we'll let that uh, be figured out by other people down the road. So I'd like to invite back Nancy Davidson and John Lee. We've gotten a ton of great questions, uh, and folks, the question line is open. Please feel free to um, to to ask questions. We both have questions that have been submitted by some of you in advance. And um, we also have some questions that are coming in as the as the call has gone on, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. If we can't answer all the questions, your individual question will get answered, and you'll get answers to your questions. And we have people who are posting uh, some of the some links to some of the topics we've been talking about. So please open up the Q and A part of the of the of the call so that you can see uh, the discussion that's going on there. So I guess the question we'll ask uh, overall. Um, what are some of the positive outcomes of what we've done and, and some of the changes? I, I read a, a fascinating um, article this morning uh, by Tom Friedman in the New York Times, an editorial where he talked about what life might be, might be like post, um, post-pandemic and how we might change both in terms of our educational systems and our work life. Um, how do you think our work life will change uh, post-pandemic? And we'll start with, uh, with Nancy. What, what do you think, Nancy? What is it going to be like in uh, in three years or two years? All of our lives, Tom, or just the medical and research life? <laughs> well, I, Nancy, go <laughs> wherever you want with that, because I bet, I bet the people yeah. on this call would like any of your uh, thoughts. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm going to start with medical care. And I'm going to say that I hope that key elements are going to be unchanged, which is, you know, being patient-centered and trying to figure out what's best for the patient and what we can take from what we've learned to make that even better. I hope one thing we're going to see is real, real careful attention to when patients can be cared for in their home and whether there are other ways that we can do that and when they actually have to be coming into our facilities. You know, for us in oncology, so much of what we do is interventional, right? We do tests, we do imaging. We give treatments. And so a lot of that probably still will require that you be in the office, per se. Um, but there might be other things that we can do for outpatients, for example, routine um, follow-up. So I hope we're going to see a lot of that. I hope we're going to see telehealth really be crystallized as a regular part of medical care for everything, including cancer care. Uh, for me as a researcher, I, I uh, hope that people like John who are going to continue to be enabled in the lab. I think that's still going to be an in in lab uh, kind of uh, experience, as I'm sure he'll talk about. I do wonder for us as a a uh, society how much we'll travel. You know, Tom, I I and you, I suspect, and John spent a lot of time on the road going to various scientific and medical meetings, and I haven't gone out of town for a medical meeting since February 20 something. I've been here the whole time. I sure miss my colleagues. I miss the uh, informal interactions that we have. I miss some of the really deep interactions. But we've been able to accomplish a lot of our work remotely. And so I hope we're going to figure out how to right-size that as well. When do you really need to get on a plane and go somewhere and do it face-to-face? And when can we actually do things in this virtual world? And can we learn how to use it the most effectively? A very good point. And, John, I'm going to ask you a similar question. I'm going to throw a little curveball because one of our uh, participants, a gentleman named Casey King. I'm wondering if it's the Casey King that I know from uh, from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, but Casey King has asked and said that mixed reality applications like the Microsoft HoloLens suggest a possible technologic solution for cancer research and care in the in the uh, e- in the in the era of COVID. Um, give us a little sense of how technology might be involved and whether something like the HoloLens application might might have some benefit. John, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree with Nancy. I think that uh, developing uh, new technologies in which we can uh, connect virtually will really be the key moving forward. I spent countless hours on planes and airports traveling for grant review panels for scientific meetings, obviously enjoying the companionship of peers in the research field. Um, But I think, you know, for safety's sake and for sort of practicality, I think we can accomplish a lot um, just via virtual meetings. And, you know, we do miss something that uh, we don't get with in-person meetings and perhaps some of these, uh, you know, virtual reality or, or HoloLens type technologies can bring some of that back where, um, you know, these people our brains to think that, you know, we are in the company and 
not physically distance as we are now uh, with uh, many of our colleagues. And, and Christy, you actually um, have thousands of people, well, maybe not thousands, certainly hundreds of people who are working in clinical research across the University of Washington, um, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Seattle Children's, Fred Hutch. Um, how have you seen the ability to coordinate all that work change uh, during the pandemic? And what lessons do you think you've learned um, to make us a better place in terms of regulatory and compliance and protocol adherence as we move forward? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, early on um, in the pandemic, we we started having daily calls with research managers across you know, four institutions we work across um, on a daily basis in our clinical research. And to have all of those representatives from our different research groups come together on a daily basis and hear what each other was was dealing with some of the challenges because of COVID, but also just some of the other challenges that they would be facing anyway. And to to see how quickly could we could resolve some of these issues by having those types of relationships and and quick ongoing conversations, it was it was pretty remarkable. And so that's one thing that we've carried forward, um, you know, as as things have become more stable and we've we've learned how to work in our our new normal. Um, is having more frequent teleconferences across the organizations instead of folks feeling like they needed to trek across areas of Seattle or campus to get somewhere for, for people to be calling in has really increased um, some of the communications and links between, between our teams, which I think has been really beneficial. I think we've also been able to work across teams in, in ways to limit exposure of additional staff to the clinic as well. And so we've had teams coordinate if we know that we have trials across three of our groups that are requiring some research staff to go to the clinic on that day, instead of sending three separate people from those teams, we can organize to have one person do whatever those those tasks are in the clinic, again, to reduce the exposure for everybody. And, and, and um, yeah, it's been, I think it's been one of the really, really great results of, of working in this way. That's great. And so, Nancy and John, with you on here, I think it's, it'll be hard for us not to answer some of these questions that have come in because given your expertise and given the impact that prostate and breast cancer have on so many patients and so many family members, and I suspect we probably have several survivors of breast cancer and prostate cancer on the line with us today. And so, Nancy, one of the questions we've gotten for you specifically is, Metastatic, metastatic, uh, I was going to say metastatic prostate cancer, metastatic breast cancer. What are you most excited about right now? Uh, what's the one thing that's happening in metastatic breast cancer that you say, gosh, that's going to really have an impact? Mom, I don't think you can ask me to pick amongst all my children. I think there are a couple of things I'd like to bring to everybody's attention. Um, one is that the field of HER2 metastatic breast cancer has continued to explode. You know, this is the place where Herceptin was the first treatment. We've now got a half dozen treatments that target the HER2 gene in one way or another, and which we can now bring to bear in the setting of advanced breast cancer. And we're beginning to test them more and more in early stage breast cancer. In the field of triple negative breast cancer, that's the ones that don't have the estrogen receptor, they don't have the progesterone receptor, they don't have the HER2 protein. And so where our, our fallback has been to chemotherapy, we now have the opportunity to use the first of the checkpoint inhibitors, you know, those, those immune therapies that are used for so many diseases now, and which had not been very effective in breast cancer. It looks like they actually could be used uh, to good effect with a certain chemotherapy for advanced triple negative breast cancers. We also have our first targeted agents um, or other agents for triple negative breast cancer specifically. So I'm really excited about that. You know, in our research area, Tom, we're busy doing CAR T cell trials for certain kinds of advanced breast cancer, trying to bring the technology and the thought process that have been developed here in blood cancers and figure out whether we can bring it to bear into a certain subset of breast cancers. And finally, in the estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, we shouldn't forget the big impact that the, the drugs called the CDK4-6 inhibitors um, have had in the last couple of years when we pair them with hormone treatments. So I think my point would be that breast cancer is actually a lot of different diseases. And then we're making headway in each of these subsets of breast cancer in advanced breast cancer with new agents to combine with our old agents 
and we're now able to think about how we can bring them in certain circumstances to try to treat earlier breast cancer. Like you talked about earlier, you know, where you take something that works in the advanced setting, whether it's an infection or cancer, and then you think about applying it earlier in the disease spectrum in the hopes that you can head off more serious complications. And Nancy, thank you, John. You and I are both um, vulnerable to having to take boards in oncology every certain number of years. And what Nancy just told us will be our board refresher course for the breast cancer section of the board. So we, we can stay on top of that. John, perhaps you can answer the same question in, in, in bladder cancer. What's the thing that's most, excuse me, in prostate cancer, because you talked about bladder earlier. In prostate cancer, what's the one treatment for men with advanced prostate cancer that you're most excited about? Um, I would say right now the one treatment that I'm most excited about is actually a radial ligand therapy. And so what that is, is it's essentially a, a little chemical molecule that's very specific for a protein that's expressed on the surface of prostate cancer cells, and that's linked to a uh, radioactive uh, uh, molecule. Um, and so we can actually in introduce these into patients. Uh, it really homes to the prostate cancer directly, and that radioactive molecule can then induce damage to the prostate cancer cells and kill them. Um, and so this sort of technology um, targeting a protein called PSMA, or prostate-specific membrane antigen, it's already been tested in Germany uh, in hundreds of patients. Um, in patients with advanced metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, it's been shown to uh, reduce uh, the PSA levels, or prostate-specific antigen levels, which is a marker that we use to follow the activity of prostate cancer. Um, there have also been uh, responses where tumors can shrink and men can live longer. And just because of the trial structure uh, that's different in the U.S. versus Germany, um, it has to go through multiple steps now, but it is, is in fact, advancing um, in clinical trials in the United States. And we're hopeful that this is um, one of the standard of care treatments for advanced prostate cancer relatively. Which is, which is terrific. Um, Christy, I guess a question I would ask you is, as someone who's involved in in thinking about clinical trials, um, Nancy and John and I get a lot of emails from patients and family and friends who want to know about clinical trials that might be available in a given disease. Um, what do you think the best suggestion you would have for, for friends or patients that contacted you? How, how should people learn about clinical trials that could be available at the Fred Hodge or other cancer centers around the country? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There, we have so much information available to us, and sometimes that can be a little over, overwhelming. Um, I would start, of course, with the Fred Hutch and SCCA websites to look at the trials that, that we offer, because I think we're obviously a, a world-renowned cancer center, and if you're lucky enough to live in this area, um, that to me seems the, the natural place to start. If someone's looking across all types of trials and not necessarily focused on cancer or, or even in this region, you know, our, our government has put a lot of focus on developing clinicaltrials.gov, which is the, the national uh, website and database that uh, has all of our all of our trials conducted across the country and, and as well as uh, result reporting for a lot of those trials. And there's just been a big push to um, have that transparency across all the different types of trials that are being conducted. And that would be another place that I'd recommend people go to get some of that information. Which is really important, so, so thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Next, I have a question for that's come in. I think it would be good for, for Nancy. Perhaps, John, you might have a perspective, or, or Christy as well. Um, and the question is, you know, we've had this focus on COVID. Has it detracted from some of our cancer abilities? And um, and specifically, the question is, what about rare cancer? Meaning, and, and it sounds like the person who asked the question, uh, uh, Anand Nukala, uh, is concerned about uh, uh, sarcomas and, and, and uh, research in sarcomas. So the question would be, has COVID made it harder to do cancer research? And particularly rare diseases like COVID, I mean, excuse me, like sarcoma, how do we um, see any potential opportunities uh, for sarcomas down the road. Uh, Nancy and then John, if you have some thoughts on that. We have a really terrific sarcoma program here at Fred Hutch UW. Uh, you know, as you point out, it, it is a rare group of diseases. There are a lot of different kinds of sarcomas, as we were talking about earlier. Um, I think the clinical trial group has not missed a beat. Um, 
all of the things that Christy said that were relevant to our entire clinical research portfolio, the kind of brief pause and now the ramp up has continued to be true, true across all diseases, including our sarcoma team. And I would put out that our sarcoma team actually just completed and reported a really nice early phase trial from our center that looked at individuals with uh, advanced sarcomas of all types um, and treated them with an old drug, doxorubicin, a chemotherapy drug, but combined with one of the new checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab. They just published this a couple weeks ago. What they showed with this combination was safe and that it was effective in some patients. And they were able to do the kind of correlative science that we'd like to see where they're trying to figure out who's who um, in this patient population. And I think they've come away with the sense that there might be certain subtypes of sarcoma where this combination might be able to be tested more appropriately in the future. So I would put that out as a snapshot, Tom, for how research is not going away because cancer is not going away as fast as we would like. And that our disease groups, whether they're studying a common disease or whether they're studying rare diseases, they really aren't missing an opportunity. They are thinking about how they're going to move their science and their research forward every single day. And we're making sure that we can keep it safe for our patients to be with us in order to take advantage of that research if they're so inclined. That's 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 fantastic. And, and John, along those same lines, um, there are rarer subtypes of prostate cancer, for example. Um, do we have research in those rarer subtypes and for patients who may have, let's say, a neuroendocrine phenotype of their prostate cancer or, or another type of unusual genetics of their prostate cancer, what are the options for patients in that setting? Absolutely. Um, the variants of uh, prostate cancer are really near and dear to my heart. That's something that uh, I studied for several years uh, as a postdoctoral fellow and continue to study. Um, the Hutch has really led the way in defining the, these different rare variants of prostate cancer. Um, it's really related to research studies in which uh, patients have really contributed tissues um, for analysis. And so we've been able to do both genetic analyses, um, proteomic analyses to really establish what are the differences between these different types of cancers. And we are, in fact, making headway in determining new types of targeted treatments that may be effective, effective in one sub subtype of prostate cancer or another. Um, we are trying to get clinical trials up and running to really serve uh, these populations of men uh, who otherwise don't have any effective options. Right, and I think that's an important important point to to mention the the importance of uh, of, of of having clinical trials even for rarer diseases. And Christy, you deal with an element of this, which is you know the National Cancer Institute looks at us and and. They don't like it when we have trials that are open that don't accrue, even if they're for rare disease. So if you take a rare cancer, some of the pediatric tumors, for example, which don't fortunately don't happen very frequently, or some of the rare subtypes that John was talking about um, and, and some of the other rare subtypes, how do, how do you handle that as someone running the clinical research process? If You know, there are some subtypes where you could open trials for patients we might only see one or two a year, but for those one or two patients, it could be incredibly important. How do you handle that from your perspective? Yeah, it's challenging, and you always want to balance the efficiencies and resources and operations against right, the impact you can have with those one or two patients in a rare disease. Um, and so ideally, we're, from my perspective, I'm looking at the resource, say, how, how are we best using these resources? And I said in rare disease, it's, it's not just about the numbers, so those have to be considered in a different, with different criteria than our our trials that aren't for rare diseases, so that we aren't we aren't overlooking those opportunities to make that impact. And so we actually have provisions in in policies that are um, exceptions to some of those rare diseases and those trials that are targeting specific specific. Um, 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 uh, molecular subtypes of in tumors and things like that and so that we again we're not excluding our ability to make impact in some of those trials where we know the enrollments will be will be lower and so we have to balance that with some of the trials that that have have larger enrollment numbers but it's it's definitely a balance and we we ensure that we have resources and space for for all of it so it's it's critical so, to our mission may i may i inter, inter oh, oh, please just something to follow up on what Christy said, because, you know, I, I think lots of cancers are rare diseases right now. And 
And one of my favorite examples is a kind of rare molecular change called the Trek fusions, which some cancers have. Turns out these things can take place in a lot of different kinds of cancers and in kid cancers and in adult cancers. And so one of my very favorite papers last year actually was the report of testing a particular drug for this called larotrectinib for these track fusion cancers. So first they had to figure out who the patients were. We participated in it. And it turned out if you really identified those patients that this inhibitor, this track fusion drug was very, very, very good. And so here, because of people like Christy, who allowed us to open this very rare trial, we had the ability to have our pediatric oncologists, our adult oncologists, and our pathologists be involved in this trial, which demonstrated the efficacy of this drug in the youngest patient was four months old, treated here in Seattle at our children's hospital, um, up into adults with all cancer types. If they had this track fusion, they did extremely well with this drug. And this trial which you allowed us to help open here is the one that led to the approval of this drug by the FDA. So these are such important trials because they can make a difference in establishing a drug that's important for a rare but important subset of patients. And that's incredibly, I mean, that's a really remarkable example of that and, and, uh, and a really good, good example to point out uh, about, uh, about how we can all work together in that respect. One question's come in, which I'll take, um, and not that I have the answer to it, but the question is, when will we have a COVID vaccine? Um, so I'll give my I'll give my stab at trying to come up with this. Um, uh, as as you know, um, we um, we will have uh, some data, which we expect by the end of this year. Uh, on uh, the first the first interim data should be available toward the end of this year, probably on the Moderna and the Pfizer products, which are the mRNA vaccines. Um, and I read yesterday um, that uh, the Moderna product, product would have its first interim analysis once 53 events have happened. Um, and now what we don't know is are those events in the treatment arm or are those events in the people who receive the placebo? So it's, is it the treatment arm or placebo arm? That makes a big difference. Um, and how those events are, are, are seen in those two arms will make an enormous uh, difference overall. Now, that early analysis might show something dramatic. So if there's 53 events and 49 of them happened in people who got placebo and three happened in people who had, uh, who had the vaccine, I think that's a pretty good sign that you're going to see a pretty early emergency authorization or approval once some safety information is available. So it's not like the data would come out in uh, late November and the drugs available for people to get at CVS in mid-December. Uh, they've got to also make sure, remember, there's two elements on vaccines. There's the efficacy, and then there's the safety, and then they've got to look at the safety to make sure that's the case. So um, that's why my gut would say that, that even if the data is dramatic, we're probably talking the early part of next year for when it will be available uh, for people. The reality is, is, as John and Nancy and Christy know very well, usually it's not 49 and 3. Yeah, usually it's something that's slightly less clear than that, and it might be that they have to wait till the next analysis when there's more events to get a sense of the difference between the two groups. And so that's something that will be very important, and there's statisticians who look at this really carefully, and there's an FDA advisory committee that will also look at this, and we're, and we're delighted that one of the Hutch's own is a member of that FDA advisory committee, Dr. Steve Pergam, and he'll be part of that committee that will look at this data and get a sense of, of what's happening uh, in the vaccine uh, world. Um, in fact, the person at the FDA who is responsible for vaccines, Dr. Peter Marks, will be the guest speaker at our faculty uh, retreat, uh, which is happening next week. So our faculty members will have a chance to, uh, to talk to Dr. Marks. Um, I'm not sure he'll be able to say much about this. I suspect that will be considered highly confidential, um, but we'll certainly have the chance to ask him about this. Um, so I, I would say that we'll get our, you know, the, the publicly available information is we'll get some, some early looks will be in, in November, December-ish. We're probably talking about a vaccine becoming available in the hopefully early to mid part of 21. Uh, assuming that things go well. What I just saw right before this call was that the state of Washington has come up with this initial plan for how whatever that vaccine is will be distributed. And they've been very careful to say that they'll be making strong efforts to make sure that 
vulnerable populations, both in terms of people who might be at increased risk for getting the disease, as well as complications from the disease, will be prioritized, and that they will work hard uh, to just make sure that, that the vaccine is distributed in an equitable fashion. Um, and so again, it depends what the what the vaccine is, what the characteristics of the vaccine are. Is there any way to know which populations might benefit more from the vaccine? That's another question we have to ask. You know, what about children? What about um, what about uh, patients with other comorbidities? Do they do better with one vaccine or another? So that's the thought on the vaccine. I, I, I don't think I don't think it's possible to really be more precise uh, than that at at uh, at this uh, point as we look at that. And so uh, the last question, which just came in, I will send to Nancy, which is kind of what you just talked about, but it's specific uh, for, for breast cancer. Astrid uh, Margosian asks, um, what is your experience with um, genomics and precision medic medicine applications in breast cancer? Well, we use an early version of uh, precision medicine in, in early stage breast cancer pretty much every day. You know, there are multi-gene tests that are out there that are commercially available, things like the Oncotype test or the MAMA print test, which we use in the early stage of breast cancer to help us select for or against the use of chemotherapy in addition to hormone therapy. Um, looking at these things in more metastatic breast cancer, that's coming along right now. Um, right now, I think we're trying to figure out what the value is going to be in metastatic breast cancer for these panels to help us select more precision therapies. The, the uh, Genes that are available to us right now that have particular targets are BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation breast cancers, and also these these uh, breast cancers that have PIXC3A mutations. Uh, there's a particular agent that's available for them as well right now. So in advanced breast cancer, a little bit more, a couple of genes at a time, but I think that we're very much in the exploration stage of how we can do a larger profiling, and perhaps that will be useful to identify more specific treatments. Great. Nancy, thank you. John, thank you. Christy, thank you. I want to thank all the uh, supporters and donors to the Fred Hodge who have participated in today's call as well. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning how incredibly important fearless science is to ending both cancer and COVID-19, and that the world really does look to the Hodge for new ideas and for cures uh, for these diseases. Um, fearless science needs your support now more than ever. As you can imagine, this has been a very challenging year from a philanthropy standpoint because of um, all the difficulties people have had economically and um, and and with the pandemic. Uh, you can go to fredhutch.org uh, backslash donate now to directly support the science that's needed to end cancer in the pandemic. Um, I hope you've had a chance to, to hear some of the most exciting elements of what we're doing at the Fred Hutch. And again, I appreciate everything uh, uh, people at the Hutch are doing um, to approach both cancer and COVID. Please save the date for our next President's Conversa Conversation, uh, which will be on Wednesday, uh, November 18th. I want to thank you all and wish you all a fantastic afternoon.